Once there was a mountain called Peak 15. Welcome back to Larry King Live with Mark David Chapman. You will all be used to your community looking like this. Think hard. The first it's Damn it, everything on TV sucks. <sighs> yeah, 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 this sucks. Um, maybe we should, like, um, get another TV. <laughs> Shut up, buttwad. I'm trying to watch this crap. <sighs> At the time of writing this script, it's been exactly one year since the very first comic book Deep Search. I sort of can't believe this miniseries is coming to an end. It honestly feels like yesterday I started writing the first entry, but there's no need to be emotional because there are plans in the works. I welcome everybody to the sixth installment of Deep Searching the Murkoff account. If you like imbuing yourself with knowledge on all things Outlast, including non-canon theories, then this is the perfect video for you. There are six comic books, each of them a treasure trove of information that need to be explored and broadcast. In this video, I'm going to be discussing Volume 6, aka the last issue of the comic books. During my thesis, I'm going to be explaining every single element that some may have found difficult to understand. For example, if a specific event or location is mentioned by a character, I will give context behind what that individual said. However, the prerequisite of my synopsis will be the narration of the comic book. The reason why this will happen first is that it's for those who have never read it before. That will hopefully drop most of the confusion some of you may have. After these two steps happen, I will give my personal theories on the comic book. My hypothesis will be based on unanswered questions or things mentioned that are not able to be calculated in a narrow perspective. Before the main topic of this video commences, I would just like to say that I created a Patreon for my channel. If you would like to support me in my endeavors, then I'd recommend checking it out. Anyway, now that we got that out of the way, it's time for the video. I hope you enjoy this last exploration. The transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development. Partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow, Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department comes in to minimize economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people. They are here to make sure it doesn't cost the company any more than it has to. Paul Marion and Pauline Glick, Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Officers. There we go, my child. Every last drop of salvation. Your children are waiting for you in heaven. God does not pour half measures. The storm is abating. All these undeserved blessings. Seven hours later. Where's Paul Marion? Sorry, Agent Glick. He's still not answering. Send people to his house. He was in Temple Gate weeks ago. Somebody outside Murkoff connected the dots between Mount Massive and Temple Gate, and they've been feeding Marion information. That's no good. I'd put my money on Simon Peacock, and if we find him, I'll put electrodes on him. How many bodies are we looking at? Hundreds. It'll take us days to get them all sorted. A lot of these local corpses show signs of cyanide poisoning. God damn, this guy's heavy. That doesn't look like cyanide. Yeah, a lot of them got creative about dying. The woman's real name is a mystery. Multiple traumas. Took a lot of whatever killed her to get the job done. By her teeth, I'd guess she's not a local. This is her, right? Lynn something? Last name sounds like a crustacean you're not supposed to eat? Langerman. How did you know? She was at the hospital last week, asking questions about the escaped Templegate woman. Fucking Paul Marion. He was supposed to be making sure she and her husband, Blake, didn't find this place. We got one breathing here. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Is that from Wrath of Khan? It's actually the Book of Job, by way of Moby. I know what it is, Agent. You don't have to try to impress me. Well, holy shit. It's him. It's Blake. Though his eyes are all pupil, completely catatonic. What's the closest black facility with ME-compatible forensic psych? Elrich? Afraid so. Well, take him there. We need to dig into his head. Don't be gentle. They rarely are. 
Agent Glick, our guy just broke down the door of Paul Marion's. No sign of him or his daughter, but there was blood on the walls. Looks like something was written and smeared away. Agent Glick, what do you want to do? Find Paul Marion. Actually, no. Do me a favor and find his corpse, because if he's still alive, he's fucking dangerous. Where's my daughter? You're asking the wrong question. I'll still help you find the answer, but you'll need to trust me. We have to find the wall rider. Murkoff destroyed the wall rider. What about Miles Upshur? Dead. And Billy Hope? Dead twice. And you found nothing in Templegate. How about you just tell me whatever it is you want to tell me? I don't know much, except that what Murkoff made of me was a rough draft, and what they stumbled onto when Miles Upshur found Billy Hope and the wall rider is the masterpiece. The morphogenic engine process needs a delivery mechanism, a method of infection. At Mount Massive, in the lab, they could customize the process to the patient, force it into their brains with video, mold the nightmares to open their minds. But out in the world, it's not surprising religion would be such an effective delivery mechanism. God's communicating with men, God's dividing themselves into components that men could understand. A trinity. Even in Templegate, they practice the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I start deep searching, I would just like to say that I already discussed all the implications of page 2. In all of the comic books, page 2 is the exact same. Anyway, let's get on with the research. Our story starts off with Sullivan Noth helping a woman drink a cup of potassium cyanide. The scene is no doubt inspired by the November 18, 1978 Jonestown Massacre, where more than 900 people lost their lives from mostly forced cyanide poisoning. After the woman drinks the cyanide, Noth walks back to the chapel behind him where he presumably finds Blake with the baby in his arms. However, we don't see that. We are focused on the countless amounts of ants swarming the radio tower from atop the hill. The ants chip away at the tower until it eventually breaks and blows up. The light that emanates from the explosion is most likely the same from the end of Outlast 2, where Blake sees the sun explode. Approximately seven hours later, Pauline Glick with several other agents and a cleanup crew investigate the carnage and assumably the radio tower's destruction. One of the agents says, these local corpses show signs of cyanide poisoning. This statement confirms the drink that Noth was giving the woman earlier was laced with cyanide. As the secret Murkoff unit continues the cleanup operation, they find Lynn Langerman's deceased body. Pauline says something that's pretty interesting after the discovery. She says, she was at the hospital last week, asking questions about the escaped Templegate woman. Fucking Paul Marion. He was supposed to be making sure she and her husband Blake didn't find this place. I have a question. How did Lynn find out about Anna Lee in the first place? From the last comic book, the entire Anna Lee event was extremely small, relatively speaking. And that's not even mentioning that everything took place in the middle of nowhere. How could these two bigwig investigative journalists find out about something so microscopic? I have a theory that may explain why this occurred, but I'll save it for the theory section of this video. Coming from page 7 and entering page 9, Pauline tells one of the other agents that Blake needs to go to a black site. For those who don't know, a black site is a location at which an unacknowledged black operation or black project is conducted. An example that everyone should be familiar with is Guantanamo Bay. Before the CIA officially recognized the facility, Guantanamo Bay was a black site. However, some people still consider it to be one. Further down the page, Pauline makes her thoughts clear about Paul Marion. She says, do me a favor and find his corpse, because if he's still alive, he's fucking dangerous. She's basically saying, find Paul and kill him. I wonder if she will have a change of heart after she realizes Paul was kidnapped instead of conspiring against Murkoff. However, considering the two perspectives are being told from the future and that this is the last comic book, I can't really pinpoint or make an educated guess on how the two of them ended up as enemies. Clearly, if Paul told Pauline he was kidnapped and didn't divulge any top secret information to Simon, there would be no need for killing him. I guess what I'm trying to say is, what motivated Paul to go to the FBI facility in the first place? And why was Pauline at the infirmary? We are missing an event that took place between the two and I have no information that would lead me to guess what transpired. It's a mystery that I hope is explained in the next batch of comic books. The last three pages are pretty self-explanatory. However, there are two theories I was able to come up with from reading the dialogue between Paul and Simon. Now it's time for the theory section of the video. While reading this issue, I came to a small epiphany at the end of page 7. On the fifth panel of said page, Pauline says, Fucking Paul Marion, he was supposed to be making sure she and her husband Blake didn't find this place. 
Obviously, we can assume the reason why Paul slacked off his responsibility was because he was kidnapped by Simon Peacock, which could have made it easier for Lynn and Blake to discover the murder cover-up. It seems pretty open and shut. However, considering Lynn and Blake discovered the Annalee incident with no such ease, even though the event took place in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, who's to say Paul didn't tip the duo off? Just like how Wayland Park tipped off Miles Upshur. No evidence exists, however, it wouldn't have been unrealistic for his character to do. Judging from past comics, Paul isn't enamored with the fact that he silences people to cover up loose ends. Let's also take into consideration that Paul Marion is technically a whistleblower. He's at the FBI on-site hospital divulging top-secret information to a government agent. Even though we're lacking information between his kidnapping and present events, it shows that his conscience is still dominant. Knowing that he was one of the reasons why a pregnant woman was murdered might have consumed him with guilt, and this would have led him to secretly tip off the investigative journalists. If this is the truth, then Paul Marion was the catalyst that thrusted Outlast 2 into a bona fide reality. On page 10 of the comic, Simon Peacock says this, I don't know much except that what Murkoff made of me was a rough draft. I can only assume he's talking about how he was a prototype of some sort to the fully realized wall writer. However, there's one thing that confuses me. As we know from issue 4, Simon used to work for Murkoff until he leaked confidential information to the public. Why would a Murkoff employee be experimented on? You could say after leaking the information, Simon was kidnapped, just like Waylon. But that's not possible because on page 11 of issue 4, Paul makes it clear that after leaking the information, Simon vanished entirely. He would have had to have been experimented on prior to the leaks. Maybe Simon actually volunteered to participate in Project Wall Rider, and after becoming horribly disfigured, he decided to leak the confidential information. But that's almost incomprehensible. Simon must have witnessed what the experimentation does to people, so it doesn't make sense that he would volunteer for something so dangerous. And that's not even mentioning that inmates were being experimented on, so there would be no need to work on a staff member. No matter how much I think about it, I can't make sense of how Simon would have participated in the project. Maybe when future comics come out, more information will be released on what his past life at Murkoff looked like. Considering the monologue that happened at the end of the comic book, I can only assume Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic was used for wall rider experimentation. I come to this conclusion because the treatment that was happening at the clinic was one of religion and hypnosis on PTSD soldiers, which sounds strikingly similar to the Templegate incident, minus the soldiers. What if before Templegate, Murkoff used Spindletop to further the progress on Project Wall Rider? It just seems too perfect not to be the case. Luckily, I even have some evidence for my claim. It's revealed that Jeremy Blair actually purchased a psychotherapy clinic. Let me say that again in different words. The head of the Mount Massive facility purchased a psychotherapy clinic that helps PTSD-ridden soldiers by utilizing religion and hypnosis. If that's not enough for you, Chris Walker is literally a byproduct of the experimentation at Spindletop. Everything just seems to fit into place. Thank you everybody so much for watching this video. This comic book marathon was definitely a very fun journey that I'm glad to have voyaged. I hope you all have a fantastic day and I'll see you in the next video.